Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, and uh, thank you to Larry for asking me to speak. A little secret, I'm not really from San Diego. (laughs) I'm Lisa, I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) Um, But I've been here uh, for about seven years now, which is fascinating to me. Um, Congratulations to everyone that got the medallions and um, the newcomers. There are a lot of you. Uh, Welcome. If you want what we have, do what we do because this program works. Um, thank you to the, the five, ten minute speaker, uh, for talking about the fact that relapse, relapse doesn't have to be a part of, of sobriety. Um, I got sober in Boston. Um, <laughs> which by the way, I was supposed to be here a few weeks ago, but my beloved Patriots were in the playoffs and I had to reschedule. So I know, I know. Haters, I know there's some haters out there. Um, no, but it is an honor to really to be um, asked to speak here. To be asked to speak anywhere, it's an honor because I am a real alcoholic. And what I mean by that is I take a drink and all bets are off. I never know what is going to happen. The book talks about the three types of drinkers, and I'll talk about that a little later because I have 45 minutes to talk, so I'm sure I'll get into that. But, um, you know, I drank for uh, about four or five years, and um, I got, uh, actually next month, I'll have, unbelievably so, 34 years of sobriety. <laughs> and really, I've done nothing... I've done nothing to deserve that. Um, And I know you're saying, you got sober when you were five? And yes, I did. (laughs) I was five when I got sober. (laughs) But I was young. So for the young people that are out there, you know, when I came into, well, let me back up. My drinking um, was fast and furious. Uh, other substitutes are a part of my story, but this is Alcoholics Anonymous, and so I'm going to talk about alcohol here tonight. But um, please know that there were other substances that were involved in my demise and, and directly involved in the fact that I got here so young. And, um, you know, like I said, I drank for, or maybe I didn't say, I drank for about four years, four or five years, and right from the beginning I drank like a pig. You know, I drank like an alcoholic, like everyone else was able to go home, meet their curfew, get up and go to school. Um, you know, I was not (laughs) like right from the beginning, I drank like an alcoholic. There was no invisible line to go over. Um, you know, there was some fun. I mean, I had some laughs, I guess. Um, but right from the beginning, there was blackouts. Right from the beginning, there was urinating myself. Right from the beginning, there was fist fights, and I was a teenage runaway by the time I was 14. I had an older sister. She was 10 years older than me. So when I was 14, I had an ID that said I was 24. And um, that got me in a lot of trouble. Back then, you know, you could go to bars. Where, as long as you had an ID, you would be served. It wasn't like now where, you know, you could, you know, the bar owner could go to jail for serving you. Um, and so I was drinking in bars at a really young age and, um, you know, living a lifestyle that um, got me into AA at a really young age. I ended up in a detox. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about my drinking because we all know what happens um, to us out there. You know, uh, granted, I, I didn't have a lot of... Uh, things to, you know, I wasn't an adult. I wasn't adulting yet (laughs) to Dominic, (laughs) but, um, but I still, I had a lot of losses. You know, I had right from, from the very beginning, like I said, I was lying. I was cheating. I was stealing. Oh my God, did I steal? I, I was stealing. Let me back up even further. Before I even drank, I was not right. All right. And that's why I loved the effect produced by alcohol because before I even picked up a drink, 
I talk about this often because it's so important for me to remember because I, I can still tend to, I, I fight with isolation still, you know. Um, but I was like the kid in the playground, you know, everyone else would be playing, you know, black jacks and whatever you play, bobbies or whatever, trucks and things, you know, in the playground. And I was like the six-year-old reading the book in the corner who couldn't talk to anybody, who was full of fear, full of doubt, full of what your opinion was of me, you know. And so when I picked up Booze, man, it was on. I, it was the, the, it was the magic elixir. Even when it didn't work, it still kind of worked. And so when I, when I ended up in detox, you know, again, I'm going to fast forward, but I just want to tell you a little bit about how not right I was before I even picked up a drink. Um, because now that I put down the drink, I'm still not right. <laughs> um, but that's what the steps are for, you know, a uh, day at a time. But, uh, I ended up in a detox and, um, I ended up in a detox in Boston called Mount Pleasant. And it's funny because people around that area say, oh, there was nothing pleasant about Mount Pleasant. But there, it actually was a really nice, um, you know, facility. Uh, this was back in the early 80s. I'm not going to tell you when, but it was back in the early 80s. And, um, you know, this was back in the days where your health insurance would pay for like 30 days worth of treatment. And uh, so I went in and I did uh, 30 days. We had a pool and tennis courts and, you know, um, we did biofeedback and we learned all about alcoholism. But the one thing that, that did happen there was AA came in and put on a commitment. So if you do H and I out there, thank you. Because I was in this detox and there was all this easier, softer way on how to get and stay sober going on. And these AA people came in, these hardcore men. <clears throat> <clears throat> who were getting sober in church basements, who could not understand how I could possibly be an alcoholic, but nonetheless told me how to get sober, showed me and told me four weeks in a row these same guys came in. Every night AA came in, actually. And, um, and these guys came in and, you know, told me that if I wanted to, when I got out, this is where I could find their wives or their girlfriends and to come to, you know, to this meeting. And, um, and I thank God for those guys. Hatched already. Um, <clears throat> but they came in and they told me about the real deal. They told me about this book. And they told me about how to get into stay sober in spite of myself. And I am so grateful that right from the very beginning, I have not had a drink since the day I went to detox. <clears throat> Relapse is not a part of my story. <clears throat> Again, I take no credit for that. I give you all credit for that because you taught me when I was basically almost unteachable. When I thought I had all the answers, when I thought I was different than you, when I, I thought I could find an easier, softer way, when I thought that I didn't have to f find the solution in this book, you know, and, and I thank God that people around here had patience with me, you know, and, um, thank you for that. I try to give that to my, my protégés now. <laughs> You know, because the, my my sponsors, uh, you know, in my whole sobriety, I, I've had three sponsors. Two of them passed. One of them I still have. She lives in Boston. And I have a spiritual advisor that I use here. You know, but when, when I'm really in the, when I'm really in it, I call my friend back home. She's known me since day one in sobriety. Not many people that I can say know me from day one in sobriety. And she's one of these guys' wives that I met and detox. This guy came up, Bill tells the story about how, you know, Ebby came and 12 stepped him, you know, and Roland had 12 stepped Ebby and they both have kind of the same story about how they recognized this person, but they couldn't really put a name with the face, you know, that there was something 
they just, they couldn't recognize them. And this was my exact experience with this guy that came up and put, put this meeting on in the detox. I vaguely recognized him because he was from my home where I grew up in my home city. And, but I couldn't place him, you know? And after the third week of the meeting, he said, you don't remember me, but I, I, I picked you up one night and I gave you a ride to wherever you went. And I said, Oh, wow. Well, you know, thank you. Um, you know, for not hurting me. Um, and it was like, it's so good to see you here. So good to see you here and see you sober. When you get out, this is my wife's phone number. Call her. And I did. And she is the woman that I'm referring to. That's know me. She's still sober. I'm still sober. They're not together anymore. You know, things change. They're divorced now, but, but I still talk to her, Suzanne. And she's, she's the one that's known me since, since I've been sober, you know, um, and you will, you'll make friends in here that you'll know for the rest of your life. You know, um, I was the type of person that, you know, I, I didn't know how to have relationships with people. You know, when I first came into AA, I was terrified of women, terrified. You know, I had a strange, to say the least, relationship with my mother. Uh, my relationship with my two sisters was, you know, how sisters are, you know, when you're teenagers. Um, I had a brother who I beloved, my, my brother Bobby. And uh, again, my father I loved, like the first man I ever loved was my father. So, you know, always had good relationships with men. And so that was kind of where I gravitated. And I thank God that there was old men that were really looking out for me that steered me toward their wives. So to fast forward... You know, I got sober and I stayed sober in the kitchens of these people um, back in Boston, like and in church basements, dirty old church basements with pots of coffee, and you could smoke in the meetings back then. And uh, like one half was non-smoking to accommodate them, and the other half was smoking. It was like being on like in the in the non-smoking section of a plane back in the day. It was like irrelevant. Everyone was smoking, you know. Um, but who'd have ever thought, here I stand? Not me. I'm, I'm sober in spite of myself, which is why I say I did nothing to deserve this. What I did was the work. All right, that's all I did. And I'm going to, you know, reference my book here because really my only experience comes from this book. I could stand up here and give you my opinion. <laughs> But you don't want that. We all have an opinion, and that's not going to get you sober. That's not going to keep you sober. What's going to get you and keep you sober is the black and white that's in this book. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. You know, I talked a little bit about how, how I'm a real alcoholic. And what that means <clears throat> is that I have a threefold disease, you know, as defined by the American Medical Association. <laughs> because back in the day, like when Bill got sober, there was no, you know... I, alcoholics went to the psych ward. Like we were locked up, you know, which really happens out here in San Diego. There's, you know, there's, I mean, people just kind of go where I work, which is at CMH. Uh, we would detox a lot of people there. Um, but really back in the day, you would just kind of, you know, put in the psych ward and, you know, that this is a physical, a mental, and a spiritual disease. And it's physical in the sense that I have a physical craving and once I pick, and this is once I pick up that first drink, that once I pick up that first drink, like I said, all bets are off. I don't know when I'm going to stop. I don't know if it's going to be three, you know, three beers, three pints, three days, three states away. I mean, like, I don't know. And that was how my drinking was from the very beginning. And, and that was scary, you know, uh, to, to drink that way. I didn't drink every day, but every time I drank, it was like that where I never knew what was going to happen. Um, you know, mentally, the mental obsession that precedes the first drink, this is what the book is talking about. It's talking about that sick cycle of thinking that says, maybe I'm not really an alcoholic. Maybe this time I can beat this. Maybe this time if I don't, you know, mix this with that, the same thing won't happen again. You know, it's that mental obsession that maybe I can lick it this time. Maybe I'm different. And the spiritual malady, 
which I didn't know a lot about until, I don't know, maybe really about 15 years ago until I started to investigate that whole piece of, of, you know, of drinking and, and mostly about recovery, you know, the spiritual malady and the unmanageability in recovery. Um, but the fact that, you know, when I say that I wasn't right before I picked up a drink, this is kind of what I'm talking about, that I was spiritually sick. See, I always, always had this natural inclination, and this is just for me, okay? This is my experience, that there was a higher power that existed. I was brought up as a Catholic. As a matter of fact, I went to 14 years of Catholic school, and I, I don't practice it today, but, they, but there was instilled you know, um, a belief in a higher power. And when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, and I was getting ready to go out and do my business of what I did when I was drinking, I, before I would go out, I would get on my knees. I had a little twin bed. I lived in my mother's house. I had a little twin bed with all kinds of stuffed animals on it. I was a child. And I would get down on my knees, and I would hug this little white polar bear, and I would pray on my knees, and I would say, God, Please keep me safe tonight. Help me to get home. Like the big, the big success story was if I got home at night. <laughs> that was a successful night of drinking for this alcoholic. So the spiritual malady, you know, as soon as I picked up the drink, even though I had this, this flicker, when, when I picked up booze, and when all of the unmanageability started to come into my life and the spiritual loss of values that goes along with that kind of lifestyle that I experienced, I started to walk further and further away from this higher power that I had known as a child, that I had believed in, um, and that I trusted in. You know, God never walked away from me. I walked away from him. God never left my side. I walked away from God. That's what I've learned. So a little bit for the newcomers and for the sake of the people that may be in here relapsing, it talks in here, I think, really eloquently about the mental obsession that precedes the first drink. Uh, Bill says, uh, actually, Dr. Silkworth says, this is repeated over and over, and unless the person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. And... Dr. Silkworth is talking about that sense of ease and comfort that I get when I pick up that first drink. Why do I drink? I drink because I love the effect produced by alcohol. I love the ease and comfort it provides me. And so when I put that drink down, I am restless, irritable, and discontent unless I can find some source that provides me ease and comfort that I used to feel when I picked up that first drink. I have to find a way to experience that, or I will drink again. This book tells me that. And it says that something more than human power is needed, that there's a psychic experience that needs to happen. Now, again, I'm talking from 34 years of sobriety. I didn't really start to delve into this until I was about 19 or 20 years sober. Right around when 9-11 happened, I was brought to my knees and needed to find a, a, a bigger God a way bigger God after that, but I'll maybe talk about that. We'll see. I don't know. Um, you know, the three types of drinkers, again, this book talks about how we have, how I can recover from a hopeless state of, of body, mind, and condition that when all else failed, and believe me, I tried other methods. I tried easier, softer methods. I did not want this to be the solution for me. I did not want to have to be this accountable. I didn't want to have to be this good. You know, I didn't want to have to do what this program told me I had to do. I really didn't. But, you know, it talks in here about how, you know, booze was the final convincer. And my, and my own unmanageability in my own life was the final convincer as well. You know, it talks in here, Bill talks about, in, you know, in there as a solution, nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. Solved it. Like it doesn't exist anymore. That doesn't mean I'm not an alcoholic anymore, but it means I have recovered. That alcohol 
today on the 10th of February is not an issue for me. It has been removed. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not liable to drink. I mean, the odds are, pr- are slim because of, you know, the remainder of the steps that I've worked in my life. But, you know, I hear people sometimes talk, yeah, I, was, I go to, you know, 15 meetings a week. I have five sponsors, you know, and I walked out and I picked up a drink. I don't know how. You know, I don't know what happened. You know, well, this book tells us why that happens. You know, it happens because it's actually in the opposite order of, of you know, physical, mental, and spiritual. It happens in the opposite order. It happens because I get spiritually sick. I get the mental obsession, and then I physically pick up a drink. And that's why it says when we overcome the spiritual malady, we begin to straighten out mentally and physically. But see, I didn't know that for a long time. I mean, I kind of knew it, and I did enough to get and stay sober. And all those things worked until one day they didn't work anymore. And I can tell you, it was September 11, 2001. And everything I had done up until that point didn't work anymore. And I needed to find a bigger God. And so, you know, initially, you know, my God was pretty small. And my God had control of my drinking problem. And that was it. And he did a pretty good job with that. And I trusted that if I prayed and meditated, that, you know, and did a few other things that the book talks about, the spiritual toolkit, as much as I understood it at that time, that I wouldn't pick up a drink. <clears throat> and that, in fact, proved to be true. You know, it says this. The great fact is this and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And then there's a big asterisk here, and there's a whole little appendix in the back of the book that ex- is one of the explanations of what a spiritual experience can look like or what it might look like. And if you're out there and if you're new, like, don't let any of this talk scare you. You you don't have to become, this isn't about religion. This is about spirituality. Um, and, And this has been the only way I've been able to maintain my sobriety because other methods failed. And believe me, I tried other methods. You know, I tried a lot of them. Um, it says here, there is no middle of the road solution. And so when I say other methods, I mean, middle of the road solutions. I mean, things like <clears throat> making money, men, food, sex, um, you know, different jobs, um, you know, things of that nature, gambling, um, all those other substitutes that we pick up. And if you're out there and if you've been without a drink and a drug for a while, and you've picked up one or maybe a few of these substitutes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just because we put the drink down doesn't make us well. It didn't make me well. In fact, it made me sicker. And this is why I had to delve more into the spiritual nature of what this was about. And here's, this was the choice I was at. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of my intolerable condition, drunk or sober, as best I could, and the other, to accept spiritual help. This we did because we honestly blah, 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 and it goes on. But in the beginning, this was, this is a tough choice to make. Like I said, you know, this was a really tough choice to make. I was not sure I wanted to make this commitment to give God my whole life. See, because I wasn't, I wasn't sure I trusted my higher power with everything, with my money, with my relationships, with the people I worried about, with my job, with, you know, my, the love in my life. You know, what if I didn't control this relationship? You know, what would happen to it? Most likely it's going to fall apart, Lisa, you know, and that's going to be God's will for you because you're probably not supposed to be with this person, you know, which is why I'm out here in San Diego alone. (laughs) But maybe I'll get to that too. Maybe I won't. But it's about letting go of my own self-will, see? And believing that God can and will take me to a better place in every single area of my life than I have ever been before. Ever been before. Than I can ever imagine I, I could be. Because I cut myself short. 
I did. I cut myself short thinking, oh, well, when I'm 10 years sober, this is what I thought. When I'm 10 years sober, I want a big house. I want a, a, you know, a handsome husband. I want a family. I want a white picket fence. And I want a career that, that I enjoy. That was what I wanted. That was, I thought, that was what I thought life was about. I had no conception of the true meaning of what brought joy to me. Now, I'm not saying that those things aren't nice and fun and, oh, it's getting hot. I might need your fan. You know, that those things aren't nice. And, and we all want, I want security. You know, it's part of that real, um, you know, basic hierarchy of needs that we learn about in psych, you know, anyone, you know, you learn in psych class, the hierarchy of needs that like basic security, we all need that. We all need a place to live. We all need food. We all want love, you know, and so those things are important, but those aren't the things that are important, the most important things in my life today. They're not. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> if you need it back, let me know. Um, you know, like I said, um, I would have I would have sold myself short if I thought that was what life was only about. Because I'll tell you what, because I've experienced life on life's terms, and I have had all those things. I've had successes. I've had failures. I've had built a home. I've been bankrupt. Had to declare bankruptcy in sobriety. I've had children. I've had miscarriages. I've had marriages. Marriages. <laughs> I've had divorces. You know, I've had births. I've had deaths. I've had success and failure and joy and the depths of despair that I cannot even describe verbally to you. But I have stayed sober with the grace of God and working these 12 steps in my life. And it talks in this book. And so that's what I mean when I say, you know, I would have sold my sh myself short um, because the joy that I have found in the more simpler things in life far outweighs the material things that I thought were what make the world. And they actually, they make that world go around for most people. Most people, that's what they do. You know, they work a hundred hours a week and the one about, you know, and that's what's important. And it, I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just saying for me, I had to take it to a deeper level. See, I had to, I just had to, because if I focused on those things, you know, and the Buddhists have talked about this like forever, you know, many philosophers have talked about that desire for material things is what brings bitterness and, and despair and feeling like life is not worthwhile. You know, and I don't want to be there. I don't want to live in that. I, I want to, I, I try to live in a, a place that is a little uh, bigger than that. And my God has brought me definitely to a bigger place than that. Um, you know, it talks in here about some of the different things that we, that, that we try, you know, to prove that we're not alcoholic, you know, to prove, you know, that I'm not a real alcoholic. Maybe I'm a hard drinker. Maybe I'm, you know, Maybe I only, you know, was going through a phase. Because believe me, I think I, I have had moments, dark moments in my sobriety, where I have thought, well, you were so young, Lisa. You know, Mr. Carpet Slippers, after being sober 30 years, maybe I can drink. I've had those thoughts. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Lisa, you were, you know, five when you got sober. <laughs> maybe you could drink. You know, and then... You know, but it's a fleeting thought, you know, but at the cost of uh, transparency, I have to say I've had those thoughts for sure. Absolutely. You know, and Bill talks about, that's why I, I have to enlarge my spiritual condition. Here are some of the methods we have tried, you know, and it talks about, you know, switching from scotch to brandy. And I tried all those things and I tried all, th all those things sober too, because I did not want God to be the answer. I wanted this man to be the answer. I wanted that job to be the answer. I wanted the, the Zazen to be the answer. I wanted yoga to be the answer. I wanted more money to be the answer. See, and none of that worked. None of it worked. None of that solved the spiritual dilemma that I had once I got sober. So, 
Step two, all it asks me is to, is really, is to, to basically throw my arms up in the air, you know, two and three are basically just asking me to say like, all right, uncle, you know, like maybe, you know, I'm definitely insane. I'm definitely a real alcoholic. I'm definitely insane. And maybe something outside of myself can help me with this. You know, and what I love about step two in the book is it really like him is home. I needed it to be him at home because like I said, I wasn't, it wasn't really until I was about 19 years sober that I really started to look. Is someone, some of your time in me, right? Am I being time? Where am I at? Uh, you've got 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. Okay. So I better speed this up. You know, um, I, it really like had to be him at home. Not like Lisa, God, you've given God your drink problem. Right. And that's worked, but God is enormous. God either is or he isn't. What is your choice to be? And that meant for me finally and utterly giving my life and my will to this higher power that even still I don't fully understand and I don't need to understand it. You know, I spent so much time throughout my sobriety reading book, reading wordy books and sitting knee to knee, drinking tea. And, you know, it, that's irrelevant. You know, what is relevant is that I feel God in here and I do feel God in here. And I am so grateful because if you're out there and you don't have God as a solution, I know you're hurting because I was too, you know, and that's no, you know, I wasn't drinking, but I was living like I needed one. <laughs> I'll tell you that I was, <laughs> You know, for the first 15 years of my sobriety, I, you know, I really got sober and stayed sober with ICIPA, which is the International Conference of Young People in AA. And all we did was go out dancing and sleep with each other. And we had a ton of fun and we stayed sober, but we had no spiritual solution. You know, we didn't need one then, though. We were so young. So if you're young, live it up <laughs> until you're like 20 years sober, then you'll need a bit. No. We all need, I needed a bigger solution, but I, I just didn't know it then. Um, I want to just talk for a minute about um, the third step. It says here, when I sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things follow. These are the third step promises. I have a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provides what I need if I keep close to him and perform his work well. Established on such a footing, I become less and less interested in myself, my little plans, and my designs. I feel a new power flow in. I enjoy peace of mind. I discover I can face life successfully. I become conscious of his presence. I begin. I, I will lose my fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. I will be reborn. And that is, in fact, what has absolutely happened to me. Because doing my fourth step, what I realized was I was so fearful. Like, I, I was engulfed with fear. You know, resentments, fear, sex conduct. I all looked through all this in my fourth step. And basically what I found out was I was just terrified. You know, all of that was because you weren't doing what I wanted you to do to make me feel better, see? I needed you to act a certain way to make me feel better and make me feel secure and make me be okay, you know? And my fear was really one of three things. It was my fear of my opinion of you, fear of not getting everything that I wanted, damn it, and that I deserved, and fear of losing something I, that I already had, you know? And all my fears boil down to one or all three of those fears. And it was remarkable to, to, to really like finally see that, to see that I was so fear based. And I saw, you know, and when I did my fifth step, uh, you know, and I've done a number of four steps, a number of fifth steps. It's like the peeling of the onion every time I do it. This last time being the most powerful, which was about uh, a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, sitting face to face with another person, another, another woman and like letting this person in on the whole deal. That is Lisa, the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that I'm shameful about, the things that I'm regretful about my fears, you know, and having that woman sit there and just nod her head, 
You know, it talks in this book about how the things that we have the most fear about or the things we have the most shame about or the things we feel in our life that have, we've, the, the worst things we've done, how we are going to be able to use those things to help someone else. And never has that been more apparent to me when I've done a fifth step with someone or someone else has told me their fifth step and I've been able to say, you know what? Me too. I experienced that too. Or when the person I was talking to said, you know what? I went through that too. You know, that happened to me too. And that's a, re and that's a really powerful, such an intimate, that is more intimate than sex with man. I'd like sex, a sexual relationship to sit in eye to eye with someone. Like let them see my innermost self. Just like it's a mind blower, a mind blower. You should check it out. <laughs> Better than sex, almost. <laughs> you know, so when I'm fearful today, you know, I'm just going to talk, you know, momentarily. When I'm fearful today, and I still am, still fearful. You know, it wasn't, a lot of it was removed, but um, some of it is still there, but in a lower form, a little, 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 little bit less. <laughs> Um, you know, it says, I ask God, remove my fear and direct my attention to what you would have me be. Help me stop thinking so much about myself and help me think of another, another person. You know, maybe you, maybe an alcoholic, maybe someone in Dunkin' Donuts, maybe someone in work, maybe someone that's just driving, you know, maybe someone, just maybe someone else except me, you know, because I'm all I think about most of the time and it's exhausting. <laughs> And so, you know, so six and seven, so much to say about six and seven on like such a deep level, but suffice to say when I did my fifth step, you know, every time I do my fifth step, I see what's objectionable in my behaviors, in my resentments with people, in the way I behave. I step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate, see, because they're not doing what I want them to do. So I step on their toes. I got to let them know they're not, I'm not happy. You know, in some way, either directly or indirectly, you know when you've done something I'm not happy about. And then you retaliate. Who wouldn't? <laughs> see, so I get to see in my fourth step that all these people that I think have wronged me, I have actually wronged. And that, thank you. And that they're basically reacting to my spiritual sickness. See? And that they're just as sick as I am. And those of us that have gone to Al-Anon, they say, you know, picture them with a big Band-Aid on their forehead. <laughs> and, but that's what I have, have done, you know. And the, we're all sick and suffering. You know, I'm not right. I'm not. You know, there are parts of me that are so deeply damaged. They were damaged before I got here. You know, which I don't need to get into. A lot of us are brought up in situations that aren't good. You know, damage from my own drinking and my own lifestyle. You know, and damage from time and sobriety of not having a spiritual solution. For sure. No doubt about that. I've been sober way longer than I drank. You know. So six and seven, I get to see what's objectionable. And the main thing that's objectionable to me today is that I can still act that way. You know, I'm not perfect. Again, for the sake of transparency, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm liable to get a resentment, to be in fear, to have, you know, to not live up to my sex ideal. Um, you know, I'm, I'm liable to, to not act like I'm sober or to not act like I know what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, and, um, that's why I have to work the rest of these steps. You know, eight and nine, made a list, go out and make amends. I got two amends left to make. Uh, one I'm definitely going to make when I go home. My son's running in the Boston, Mar Boston Marathon in April, so I'm going to be making one then. And then I have one left. And God willing, if I don't make any more, I won't have any more to make. You know, I'll take care of those in 10. See, because in 10, which is where I live today, in my life and my sobriety, 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis, I have to. All day, every day, you know, I, I know what my sobriety is about. I know how I need to act. I know what I need to do to stay spiritually fit. I don't always want to do it. Sometimes it gets tedious. 
Sometimes I just want to say F it and I want to do what I want to do, you know, um, but nine times out of 10, I don't. Number one, because I know that's not how God wants, that's not the woman God wants me to be today. And number two, (laughs) the consequence is too big to pay. (laughs) You know, it really is at this point in my sobriety. All day, every day, you know, I have to be considering the fact that I'm in recovery. I'm an alcoholic who has a spiritual disease, primarily a spiritual disease, right? Because if I stay spiritually fit, I won't have the mental obsession and I can't physically pick up the drink if I stay spiritually fit. It's impossible. It's impossible. So that's why I have to focus, and most of us that are long-term sobriety have to focus on staying spiritually fit. And so, um, you know, 11 is like the most important, one of the most important things in my life today. I get up super early in the morning, like an ungodly hour um, to take care of myself um, with prayer and meditation because it's such an important, it's like one of the like two important things in my life right now, prayer and meditation and helping others. And so I have to dedicate that time. You know, the book talks about, you know, we are undisciplined. So we let God discipline us in this way, in this way, prayer and meditation. And, you know, I walk, I sought for, a, you know, a lot of years, you know, again, books, different, you know, things, what's going to work for me, you know, different things. And I finally just said, you know what, Lisa, relax. You don't need to figure this thing out. You know, all you need to do is be quiet and your answers will come. And I have really come to believe and come to experience what it talks about in this book about that, that intuitive knowing, you know, I actually have one protege who says, God doesn't talk to me. You know, God does talk to me, you know, and it's that still soft, almost imperceivable voice that when I'm quiet enough, I hear, but if I'm running around shopping and, you know, doing everything I can do to avoid this God issue or this God solution, I'm not going to hear it. But if I'm quiet enough, I will. And that's why I have to discipline myself. It's a must. Like it's a no, it's like not negotiable. And, and each day is different. You know, um, I'm disciplined, but I'm not so disciplined that I don't switch it up. Um, but I do do it every day and I do it for, you know, a good amount of time. And step 12 is three parts. Haven't had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. If that hasn't happened, I I can't do the rest of step 12. I can't do the next two pieces. Help other alcoholics and work these principles in all my affairs. You know, helping Elkies is easy. I'm good at that. You know, we're good at that. We can win the, the confidence of another alcoholic in five minutes. You know, because we know when someone's both, you know, lying to us. And we know when someone knows what's going on. You know, and people know, I know what's going on. <laughs> and, and so I'm blessed, blessed with sponsor and women. And I'm just so grateful when all else fails, I help another alcoholic. And, you know, there have been times in the peg, you know, I, I moved out here seven years ago with my husband at the time, who is not my husband now, and I'm still here and he isn't. And I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for my next direction from God will give me what my next step is to be. I do not doubt that at all, but I do trust that there's a reason I was brought to San Diego and it may or may not have been to be with my husband. I know that there's a bigger scheme of things, a bigger tapestry, so to speak, you know, that I cannot comprehend, nor do I need to. You know, all I need to believe is that there is a bigger plan, you know, and I'm not a fatalist. Like, I don't believe that all I need to do is sit still and life will happen to me. I I don't believe in that. You know, I do believe I need to do the footwork. You know, if I want to earn more money, for instance, I need to either work more or go back to school, you know, things like that. I mean, 
maybe God will have me hit the lottery, but I have, that hasn't happened yet. You know? Um, and so what I'm, all I'm saying is I don't believe in a Santa Claus God. All right. I do believe in a God that will provide me and has provided me with every single thing I need and has always provided me every step of the way, even when I didn't want to believe he was, even when I demanded more than my fair share, you know, because the truth is, is that I am a real alcoholic and I should be dead. I did not think I was going to make 18. I swear to you. I did not, I sh- I wouldn't have made 18. I wouldn't have made 18. And here I am, over 18. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me share with you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.